was a kid, my mom said, work hard, you can become president, because I grew up in a Disney film. That was back when we believed that presidents were righteous and honorable, because after all, they were president. And that died in about 1974 with Richard Nixon, Watergate, blah, 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 blah. But Rich, can anybody be president? Well, that depends on your circumstances. If you find yourself standing outside of a Walmart bathroom at three in the morning, waiting on the results of your girlfriend's pregnancy test, no, you're not gonna be president. But I've watched every episode of West Wing. I want to change the world. Screw you, go start a soup kitchen. Being president is a hard job, and you really, really have to want it. When you're president, you've got thousands of bosses. Half of them demand stuff way outside your job description. The other half wouldn't mind too terribly if you were dead. So you need Disney-sized motivation, the kind of motivation that craves abuse. And here's the kicker. There's a pretty good chance the job is going to kill you. Of the 43 men who've been president, four have been assassinated, all by gunshots. Another 13 presidents have been shot at, had grenades thrown at them, car bombs planted, or someone tried to crash their plane. And for every president who's been killed on the job, there's another one where the job killed them. Franklin Roosevelt and Warren G. Harding keeled over from heart attacks. Zachary Taylor ate some bad cherries during a 4th of July celebration at Washington Monument. Died of severe diarrhea. William Henry Harrison caught pneumonia right after his inauguration. Doctors treated him with leeches in Virginia snake root. He died after being president for only 32 days. You still want the job? Fine. Just make sure that you're rich, white Protestant male, and a Freemason. Or ugly born in a log cabin and clinically depressed, because one thing is for certain, if being POTUS doesn't kill you, it's gonna prematurely age you. Just look at Obama. When he came into office, he was a good-looking, vibrant man. Now look at him, face like a used tire. So, according to the odds, there's roughly a 40% chance that as president, somebody's gonna try to assassinate you. But there is a 100% chance of character assassination. Excited. How many people here are ready to turn the White House red again? How many people here are ready to go out there and tell Hillary Clinton what difference it really makes? What difference does it make? I'm here at the presidential town hall, and these Bush supporters are feeling very good about their candidate. What do you say, guys? An election is a thing that happens every four years in America where we get to watch a lot of ego-obsessed men and women say crazy things, trip over mic cables, insult each other, and generally engage in a series of antics that makes us briefly forget we live in a world of destructive policies and a state of grim hopelessness created by these very fucksticks. Donald Trump likes to sue people. He should sue whoever did that to his face with that... Given that being president of the United States could very likely put you in a premature grave, it's fairly astonishing that at the beginning of 2016, 23 hopeful Americans threw their hat in the ring for the nation's top job. At some point, every one of these candidates has looked in the mirror and said to themselves, you know what this country needs? Me. That's the kind of haploid, diploid, megalomaniacal level of self-delusion you need to run for president. President, we're getting rid of Obamacare. They all talk about passion, service, wanting to do it for their country. Of course, there's a huge amount of ego involved in all of this. I turned out to be 100% right on illegal immigration. People two weeks ago that were going after me, even the reporters. And you're talking about a group of men, and so far they've all been men, who have been basically convinced 
from birth that they were the center of the universe. But I think most of the people running for president actually believe that they have a talent, a philosophy, an ideology, an ability to lead people, really an extraordinary gift. And if they don't, we generally find out really quickly. And where do we find out? On the campaign trail. When I'm president, you will not get into the United States of America. It's going to get tough. You're going to be on the road for two years. You're going to spend up to a billion dollars. You're going to expend a whole lot of shoe leather. And you're going to have to make some bold statements. A total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. You're going to get attacked. Your past and your family are going to come under intense scrutiny. And God help you if you've got any dirty laundry. I am confident that I never sent nor received any information that was classified at the time it was sent and received. If you're going to be POTUS, President of the United States, you're going to have to fight dirty because it's the most downright grueling election on the planet. There's nothing easy about running for president, I can tell you. It's tough, it's nasty, it's mean, it's vicious, it's beautiful. And you know what? It's all been done before. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. These are the stakes. The 1964 presidential campaign between Lyndon Johnson and his challenger Barry Goldwater introduced a vicious new tactic into presidential campaigning. Quotemanship. The idea of taking what a candidate says and turning it against them. Johnson created a series of TV ads that portrayed Goldwater as some kind of deranged whack job who, if elected, would destroy all of mankind. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. Mr. Johnson set out on a political career 27 years ago. A road that led to the White House. By the time of the 1964 election, Johnson had already been in the White House for a year, having stepped in after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He was seen as the likable heir apparent, but with a hidden agenda. He knows he's going to win, but what he, what he wants is a huge landslide victory. Because remember how insecure Lyndon Johnson was. He was following the most popular president, maybe to this day, and he didn't just want to win, that he really wanted to win by a lot, because to him that meant that the American people loved him and that therefore he could move forward out from beneath the shadow cast by the JFK presidency. Since Labor Day, Senator Goldwater has traveled tens of thousands of miles to discuss the issues of the campaign. Goldwater made the agenda easy for Johnson. His slogan was, in your heart you know he's right. And he was, extreme right. Now, Goldwater was an accomplished senator, an ex-Air Force pilot, very close friend of the late JFK, but he didn't care much for Russia or China or any other commie red bastard, and he didn't bother trying to soft soap it. And we must make clear that until its goals of conquest are absolutely renounced and its relations with all nations tempered, communism and the governments it now controls are enemies of every man on earth who is or wants to be free. In terms of articulation, let's compare that to a modern-day candidate with a whole team of speechwriters and researchers at his disposal. Hey, I'm not saying they're stupid. I like China. I sell apartment for 10... I just sold an apartment for $15 million to somebody from China. Am I supposed to dislike them? Goldwater had all the oratorical tools, alliteration, assonance, litotes, pleonasms, exclamations, epigrams, classical quotes, way more than the average American could absorb. When he accepted the Republican nomination in San Francisco in 1964, he pretty much dropped the Trumpism of his day. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Hardcore Republicans lap this up. Finally, a guy not willing to kowtow to the Reds. The more moderate Republicans, however, were genuinely flummoxed. Future President Richard Nixon had to turn and explain to his buddy what Goldwater had just said, like someone who didn't quite get a Frankie Boyle joke. Never mind that he was quoting Cicero. 
the man who pretty much laid the foundation for practical democracy. Nope, his opponents took the word extremism and milked it for all it was worth. And in no time at all, they had him starring in a one-man version of Mississippi Burning. We represent the majority of the people in Alabama who hate niggerism, Catholicism, Judaism, and all the isms of the whole world. So said Robert Creel of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. He also said, I like Barry Goldwater. He needs our help. Unlike the Stentorian Goldwater, Johnson was a folksy down-home Texan who used the Oval Office to further Kennedy's agenda of progressive social reform, eradicate poverty, promote civil rights, and order lots of slacks. Uh, Joe, uh, uh, is your father the one that uh, makes uh, clothes? Yes, sir. We're all together. Uh, you all made me some real lightweight slacks. Uh, now, I need about six pairs wear around in the evening when I come in from work. The pockets, when you sit down in the chair, the knife and your money comes out, so I need it at least another inch in the pockets. Now, another thing, the crotch down where your nuts hang is always a little too tight. So when you make them up, give me an inch that I can let out there uh, because they cut me. It's just like riding a, a wire fence. Why this knife-wielding Pecker cramped good old boy was determined to spend another four years in the White House and nothing was going to get in his way. Goldwater never had a chance. Systematically bombarded by TV ads that all implied every child in America was doomed. Do you know what people finally did? They got together and signed a nuclear test ban treaty. But now there's a man who wants to be president of the United States and if he's elected, they might start testing all over again. The best that Goldwater could do to counter this assertion was to drag out the Duke himself, old John Wayne, to provide some kind of weird cryptic voiceover that frankly made no sense whatsoever. An umbrella, just that, or the symbol for appeasement. A table, just that, or a sellout abroad. A wall, just that unless it helps you remember what has happened to a billion people in this world and what can happen to you and to your children. What in the wide, wide world of sports was he talking about? What, there was a wall somewhere with a billion people behind it? The 64 campaign had turned into something that resembled a bitter, divorced couple fighting over custody of their kids. To many, of course, he is the president first and a candidate second, but his speeches draw resounding cheers. Lyndon Johnson decided to really turn Barry Goldwater into uh, someone who terrified and horrified Americans, and they did it in a number of different ways. They wrote, uh, it sounds trivial, but they wrote hundreds of letters to the advice columnists of the time, uh, Dear Abby and Ann Landers, claiming that to be Americans who were terrified at the thought of a Goldwater presidency. Uh, they even put out a coloring book for little children, which portrayed Goldwater in the robes of the Ku Klux Klan. And then they followed up with, of course, the Daisy commercial, which was probably the most effective campaign commercial commercial in history. Johnson won by a landslide. His campaign had convinced Americans that if Goldwater was elected, he would start a war. And now, firmly re-entrenched in office, what do you think Johnson did? He went to war. This administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. That's all the Joint Military Chiefs of Staff needed to hear. War. Mm. Good God, y'all. In March of 1965, two months after being sworn in, Johnson ordered 20,000 troops to launch an offensive against poverty, a small nation on the Indochina Peninsula of Southeast Asia. Mr. Backlash, Mr. Backlash. Within 18 months, this incursion had increased to 200,000 troops, all trying to keep North poverty from overrunning South poverty. By 1967, there were more than a half million men fighting poverty, and Johnson's support plummeted to the point where he was the most unpopular president in modern times. The man who had got himself elected on a premise of saving America's children was unfortunately watching America's teenagers come home in body bags. But 
let's imagine for a second an alternative historical scenario. What if Goldwater had won? Let's say that uh, LBJ pulls out of the race due to aggravated scrotal trauma. He chooses instead Hubert H. Humphrey as vice president. Now, Hubert Humphrey is an avuncular hack from Minnesota who's been pining for the job since the end of World War II. Nobody takes him seriously, so Goldwater wins. Goldwater doesn't mess around in Vietnam. He ends that war in two weeks flat. The world knows don't mess with the USA. Unfortunately, his refusal to deal with Arab nations and their oil exports leads to a gas shortage. With the gas shortage, the auto industry stagnates. With no cars, America just becomes this place with a lot of vintage automobiles, really cool looking, but held together with duct tape, also known as Havana Chrome, and the auto industry does not progress. Thus, we never get the nimble Ford Bronco in which O.J. Simpson leads the LAPD on a high-speed chase. That chase would have been on foot, and O.J. would have easily outrun the cops, because let's face it, he was one of the fastest runners in the NFL. No O.J., no trial. No trial, no Robert Kardashian, who rose to prominence defending O.J. on the murder rap. Robert Kardashian just would have been a two-bit ambulance-chasing chiseler from Los Angeles, and his three daughters would be vapid, inconsequential bimbos hanging out at the mall. It's a tragic fact that politics in America is coming closer to resembling a reality TV show. We want to see our candidates lined up in front of a panel of judges like Fox News presenter Megyn Kelly, whose sole purpose is to create confrontation and drama for the TV audience. Your Twitter account has several disparaging comments about women's looks. You once told a contestant on Celebrity Apprentice it would be a pretty picture to see her on her knees. Does that sound to you like the temperament of a man we should elect as president? Even Obama seems to be confused about how he's supposed to exude presidentialness. Being president is a serious job. It's not hosting a talk show or a reality show. No, it's not. So here's Obama talking politics with Bear Grylls, the guy who likes to drink his own urine. Would you ever encourage your girls to go into politics? No. Uh, <laughs> but if they came to me and they said they wanted to go into elective office, yeah. I would be completely supportive. Yeah. Because I, I think it can be noble work if done for the right reasons the right way. But if any of these presidential wannabes were put into a reality show, they'd be evicted before the first commercial for being soulless, snooze-inducing, robotic dullards. Some of America's greatest journalists have tried to chronicle elections, and every one of them would have been better off following Plankton for a year. Boys on the Bus, Timothy Krauss. Michael Lewis, author of Moneyball? Yeah. Even the estimable Hunter S. Thompson, who chronicled the 1972 campaign between Nixon and McGovern, was so overcome by torpor and ennui that he just resorted to making stuff up about the candidates, just to enliven things. Claiming, for example, that Democratic nominee Edmund Muskie had hired a Brazilian witch doctor to supply him with Ibogaine. That's a hallucinogen that makes you think you're a salamander. Open season on voters gets underway as the presidential candidates start cross-country vote hunting tours. Lord, I was born rambling man. What Americans want is to be wooed by old-fashioned grassroots campaigning, which means crossing the country by bus and plane, eating pancakes, and talking to a lot of lumpy housewives at shopping malls. The campaigning itself is a pretty good test of the candidate. If they manage to get through that without flopping dead on the floor or turning into a bodacious drunk, you know, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, I sure couldn't. Uh, the, the, just the, the sheer wear and tear on these people like tells us that they're pretty sturdy physical specimens. No one who hasn't been there has any conception of how unbelievably grueling it is it's grueling and exhausting remember you've been campaigning what by the time you hit september for 16 months jumping into a plane in the morning and making four or five speeches in different parts of the country which aren't that different from the ones you made the day before it's not the most uh, <laughs> wonderful experience in that sense i want to thank the music that have been here. I understand we have the Leon High School Band and the Godfrey High School Band. President Truman continues his swing around the circuit, 
meeting former Vice President Garner at Uvalde, Texas. Campaigning for president is more than a full-time job. I mean, just raising the money is a full-time job, not to mention going out and actually glad-handing people, which is like maybe two full-time jobs. I, I really don't know how they survive doing it, because um, it is, it's just brutal. Especially this year, I mean, this is a, a grueling field. I mean, people have lasted much longer than anyone expected. Super PACs have played a, a role in keeping candidates going. The next leader of the free world is gonna have to tell us, right up front, are you going for the Broncos or for the Patriots? <laughs> and I'm here to announce to you, this guy just paid off a student loan. He looks like he's the kind of guy who should be explaining you your warranty when you buy a large appliance. After seven years of Barack Obama, this is a time of urgency. You start to hear the, the same things over and over again, said in a new way, with new reactions from the audience. Jeb Bush, decent governor, I suppose, of Florida, which is like being a manager of a Dignitas clinic. But let's face it, every family needs a Fredo, just clinging to some blind familial destiny. Hey, Jeb. Hey, W, how you doing? I've learned a lot being a candidate here, and I look forward to... They try to be as every man as possible, but they're slowly losing their identity, turning into nattering nabobs, shills, ciphers, husks. You know, they're, they're too busy flitting from rally to rally, town hall to town hall, dinner to dinner, trying to get people to like them. It's like an Academy Awards nomination if all the nominees were from the same film. I believe America can be greater than it's ever been. How we can keep America safer and stronger and freer. When our embassy is purposefully attacked by terrorists. They peddle bromides they think American voters can respond to. Things like, let's take America back. Let's make America strong again. Basically, anything that can fit onto a bumper sticker. And they desperately avoid the real issues. And the reason a candidate avoids the real issues is because Basically, both sides, Democrats and Republicans, they're on the same page. Yeah, they quibble over social welfare, but they both agree it needs to be fixed. They quibble over a few billion dollar difference in defense spending, but they both agree that we need an army that can kick the world's butt. They argue over the free market, but they both want the government to keep their big meaty paws off of it. The only difference is that Democrats stay above the waist, and Republicans, for some ungodly reason, are obsessed with what Americans do with their fundament. Abortion, Planned Parenthood, gay rights, Republicans cannot stay out of a woman's jinkity jankity. Other than that, there's no difference. Republicans, Democrats, it's a difference between hair and fur. Could I have a Coke, please? I'm sorry, we only have Pepsi. Whatever. Everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants economic growth, first yeah. and foremost. Everybody wants a balanced budget, a, a secure international scene. But we just have these two broad tendencies with a lot of Venn diagram overlap. Uh, at times like now, when the parties seem to be very polarized, that Venn diagram is over, only overlapping by about 50%. Normally it overlaps by about 80%. In terms of what they of what, want to achieve. Exactly. I am running for the presidency of the United States because citizens, it is time. It is time that we take our future back. So how do these people get themselves to stand above the fray? They build a team, a human shield made entirely of yes-men. They surrounded themselves with people who keep them sheltered from the real world and give them a courtesy reach around hand job and keep them on a steady, high-octane diet of Powerade until they turn into rutting, savage-eyed alpha males crashing through the woods looking for anything with a hole in it to fuck. But I mean that in the nicest way possible. And to get to the point where you have zillions of advisors telling you what to do and what not to do and how to do it. You don't know which is telling you the truth. You're surrounded by ambitious people. You're raising money hand over fist. It's not a lot of fun. I did rock a sun. Left home by himself, home by himself. I brought a son, left home by himself. Brought a son, left home by himself. Sent 
that's the way for me to get along. People running for president uniformly believe they can change the world. So the idea is to win at all costs. After all, if you lose, you're not going to be able to do anything, are you? Winning an election is about deflecting as much shit as the other guy can throw at you. If he claims that you fuck pigs, he's desperate. But if he puts you in a position of having to deny that you fuck pigs, you're desperate. It's 1988. After years of a B-movie Republican gunslinger running things, a lot of Americans are ready for a change. We're going to build a kind of America where hard work is rewarded, where American goods and American workmanship are the best in the world. That's what this election is all about. A Democratic governor from Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis, was primed to challenge the incumbent Vice President George H.W. Bush. I seek the presidency to build a better America. It's that simple and that big. I thought he was a serious candidate. This was clearly going to be a competitive race. I thought it was quite winnable. And if I hadn't made a couple of really bad mistakes, I think I could have won it. By working together, to create opportunity and a good life. Dukakis was determined to take a fresh approach to campaigning and avoid the mudslinging and the negativity of so many previous elections. I certainly hadn't engaged in any of that stuff during the primary, quite deliberately. And I thought people were fed up with that stuff. But the lesson to be learned from 88 is that if the other guy's coming at you, you've got to have a carefully thought out strategy. For a new era of economic greatness in America, Michael Dukakis for president. Bush, on the other hand, was an old guard politician. He'd been around a long time and he knew all the angles. And his opening gambit was to play the old crime and punishment card. As Governor Michael Dukakis vetoed mandatory sentences for drug dealers, he vetoed the death penalty. The Republicans uh, seized upon a parole program in the state of Massachusetts where Dukakis was governor, which allowed violent criminals to be released um, uh, not so much on parole, but to, to be released on work furloughs for a few weeks. William Horton escaped from the furlough program. Um, he attacked a man and his girlfriend, and he raped the, the young woman, and, and he stabbed the man. Republicans seized upon this as a way to attack uh, Dukakis as soft on crime. His revolving door prison policy gave weekend furloughs to first-degree murderers not eligible for parole. While out, many committed other crimes like kidnapping and rape, and many are still at large. Now Michael Dukakis says he wants to do for America what he's done for Massachusetts. America can't afford that risk. Never mind that those weren't convicts. Those were members of George Bush Sr.'s campaign staff, rented strangers, told not to shave for the day and make a video that basically says elect Dukakis and your kids will be kidnapped and raped. Yep, that happened and we let it happen. Smears, cheap shots, dirty tricks are part and parcel of American elections. They're the currency of American elections. Ronald Reagan himself had a furlough program as governor of California and defended the program, even though two of his furloughees went out and murdered people. But I had said, I'm not gonna do it. It's a big mistake, it's a big mistake. And it was very likely this strategy of not fighting, of not slinging back mud that cost Dukakis the race. See, one slinging serves two important functions. Number one, how a candidate responds to it is a microcosm of how they would handle duress if, in fact, they were president. Let's face it, no sane candidate is ever going to say anything bad about himself, so you have to take them out of their I'm a nice guy safety zone and uh, see what they'll do when the gloves come off. For the next 90 minutes, we will be questioning the candidates. It was during a televised debate on PBS that moderator Bernard Shaw delivered the fatal blow while 67 million Americans watched. There are no restrictions on the questions that my colleagues and I can ask this evening. He went onto a stage with millions of people watching, and he knew damn well he did something he didn't often do. He made a mistake. The first question goes to Governor Dukakis. You have two minutes to respond. We had rehearsed time and again that question. That's the question where people want to know whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the criminal or are you on the side of the victim? And we had practiced the answer. 
endlessly in debate. I mean, I can do it for you right now. It begins with, I know what it's like to be the victim of crime. Governor, if Kitty Dukakis were raped and murdered, would you favor an irrevocable death penalty for the killer? I really viewed this as being a kind of routine question. And unfortunately, I think I kind of answered it as if I had been asked a thousand times. No, I don't, Bernard, and I think you know that I've opposed the death penalty during all of my life. Uh, I don't see any evidence that it's a deterrent, and I think there are better and more effective ways to deal with violent crime. We've done so in my own state. And when Bernard reasons. Shaw asked him the question, would you support the death penalty if your wife, Kitty Dukakis, was raped and murdered, and he responded in a very robotic, stilted, falling back on his talking points fashion, and Americans wanted him to shout out, how dare you ask me such a personal question? So Dukakis was doomed. Viewed as a shell, a man with no emotion toward his own wife, and his opponent made sure there was no coming back from this mistake. And here I do have on this particular question a big difference with my opponent. You see, I do believe that some crimes are so heinous, so brutal. I walk all the way backstage, and I'm the first person to get to Michael. And he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry. I just missed it. Of course I have regret about it. I, I would have been delighted to be president of the United States. <laughs> I mean, how many people get to be president, for heaven's sake? No, I'd have loved the opportunity, but didn't get it, didn't win it. So one does other things. Let's imagine for a second an alternative historical scenario. What if Dukakis, instead of answering robotically, had actually said to Bernard Shaw, I'm sorry, Bernard, did you just ask me what if my wife was raped? How about we step outside and I punch your lights out? Then he would have been a national hero, easily beaten George H.W. Bush. No George H.W. Bush, no George Bush Jr. 12 years later to follow in his footsteps. George Bush Jr. would still have been owner of the Texas Rangers baseball team, which he would have run into the ground. So now Texas fans switch their allegiance to the Dallas Mavericks of the NBA. The Mavericks have a huge payroll and are able to hold on to both Chris Humphreys and Lamar Odom instead of trading them to the L.A. Clippers, where they promptly go off and marry Kardashians thus perpetuating the tawdry freak show nature of reality TV. The Kardashians would just be three inconsequential, vapid bimbos hanging out at the mall. So, you're probably thinking the Founding Fathers, those who created democracy in America, were upstanding and dignified men with waistcoats and really florid signatures who would never stoop to cutthroat politics. Wrong. This is the Constitution of the United States. 4,543 words that explain how the government works. This is an owner's manual for a 2014 Toyota Tundra pickup truck. The people who wrote the Constitution had no idea if it was going to work. All they knew is there had to be a better way to elect a leader. Because up to this point, historically, there were only two ways to acquire power. One, you overran a people with invading hordes, very messy. Or two, you had to find a way to successfully be born into a royal family. The Founding Fathers figured there had to be something in between. So they came up with this idea of a trilateral structure, executive, judicial, legislative, where everybody can make sure that everybody else wasn't getting too uppity. They already had the perfect choice for president, George Washington, a philosopher king straight out of Plato's Republic, a man who, other than not knowing how stupid it was to stand up in a crowded boat, was articulate, humble, and the nation's hero. So after drafting this template for democracy, the Founding Fathers immediately did the most undemocratic thing possible. They anointed Washington president, unelected and unopposed. 
Well, Washington didn't like the office um, and didn't approve of the existence of the office in a way. Nobody really knew, nobody done this before. Actually, they didn't even use the terms president or vice president at first. There was a lot of back and forth about what to actually call their leader. Okay, here's a little game I like to play. Which of these were actually suggested titles for America's leader and which are famous racehorses? Pencils ready? Elective majesty. Farlap. Bold ruler. His serene highness. War admiral. His rotundity. Superfluous excellency. Seabiscuit. Answers later. Within his first four years, Washington exposed a huge flaw in the Constitution, something the Founding Fathers and all their idealistic vision had never foreseen, which was that as soon as you're in charge, somebody somewhere is going to decide you're doing it all wrong. The Founding Fathers never envisioned the two-party system. Today, we understand the two-party system is essential for the functioning of democracy. They didn't really foresee that there are differences in self interests. They thought people would put these aside and unite uh, for the good of the uh, country. Almost immediately, two of the main architects of the Constitution started sniping at each other. Thomas Jefferson, the first Secretary of State, and Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury. Jefferson was a plantation owner, republic-minded. In other words, sympathetic to farmers and planters, he felt government should interfere as little as possible in people's lives. And by people, of course, I mean white folks. It's become fashionable in the last decade or so to uh, badmouth Jefferson and question whether he deserves that great big photo bomb up on Mount Rushmore because, uh, you know, he owned slaves. Yeah, he did. So did the first five presidents. So you want to blame the driver or the guy who handed him the keys? That would be you, Britain. Jefferson once called slavery a great stain on the nation. That was a duplicity of the times. You could call slavery a stain, and then you could have the slaves remove the stain. And as for any disparaging remarks about Sally Hemings, Jefferson's slave mistress, bear in mind that Jefferson's wife died at the age of 33. And on her deathbed, Jefferson promised he would never marry again. So. What can you do? You're the president and you can't get laid? You have to file that under lamentable, but what choice do you have? Kind of like programming on ITV on a Sunday night. Hamilton had an altogether different worldview than Jefferson. He was what you would call a federalist. He believed in big government and that if big government didn't get its act together and start making some do re mi, shore up a federal bank and print a unified currency, then America was gonna go down the dumper fast. He admired the English financial system. He admired uh, the banking system, especially in England. And he wanted to replicate those for America. Because of their polarized views on how the country should be run, Jefferson and Hamilton's animosity toward each other escalated. Jefferson and Hamilton used newspapers very unethically. Both of them were members of Washington's cabinet, yet both of them took government money and funded newspapers, the point of which was to express opinions for their side. They would plant articles in newspapers, often writing under pseudonyms. In a 1776 issue of Hamilton's paper, he, under the name Phocion, talked about the pretensions of Thomas Jefferson to the presidency. The nation must be on the guard. He was a demagogue. He wore the, quote, garb of patriotism, but only as a disguise. According to Jefferson, writing in his own paper, Hamilton's ideas were stupid, suspicious, and licentious. And they would just go back and forth, back and forth. In essence, Hamilton and Jefferson's differences derive from the ambiguity of the Constitution, because the thing about the Constitution is it's purposefully vague. That's why we spent 230 years arguing over what it means. 
For example, when it comes to describing the president's actual duties, this is what it says. The president shall take care that the laws of the United States are duly and faithfully executed. Take care. That's it? The label on my shirt tells me how to take care in four different languages. But the Constitution just says, hey, you know, uh, watch out. You can imagine that opens itself up to a lot of interpretation. Basically, Hamilton and Jefferson disagreed on how much power the president should have because Hamilton was a pragmatist and Jefferson was an ideologue. Now, Hamilton knew he could get way more done by being a behind the scenes guy, which is what he did for the next four presidencies. He was the facilitator, the go-to guy. He's on the $10 bill because he started the Federal Reserve Bank. He moved the capital from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. because he believed it should be in a neutral place. By the 1800 election between Thomas Jefferson and the watery-faced John Quincy Adams, the two-party system was firmly entrenched. And now things got really nasty, in the most gentlemanly way possible, of course, through print. Part of us as Americans have a, a Mr. Smith Goes to Washington movie in the back of our minds. There's some shining city on a hill back in that idealized past where people were good to each other and the founding fathers would never play dirty tricks on each other. Well, of course, that's ridiculous because if you even if you go back to the election of 1800 where Thomas Jefferson hires a, a writer to call a John Adams a, quote, hideous hermaphrodite unquote. And uh, the, the Federalists of John Adams attack Thomas Jefferson as, as being uh, soft on the French Revolution, just as Michael Dukakis was soft on crime. And that election included my favorite campaign trick, where the Federalists spread the rumor that Thomas Jefferson was dead, which I think is wonderful. Because really, in those days, how do you rebut that very quickly? Well, you can't vote for him. You know, he's dead. So you think the modern day media is a cesspool of slime and misinformation? Look back to the good old days when you could just pay a journalist to accuse your opponent of being insane or a sexual deviant or an atheist. Just took a little money. Jefferson won the 1800 election, became the third president of America. As for Hamilton, well, he was never going to be able to run for president because he was born in the Caribbean. He continued his career as a great facilitator, then ended up being killed in a duel with a guy named Aaron Burr. Today, his achievements have been commemorated in a Broadway musical, soon to transfer to the West End. Hamilton, the musical. So there you go. One of America's most influential founding fathers is now a hip hop musical. Cause nothing inspires wicked beats like an 18th century Federalist. Let's see if I can't find one of these all instrumental rap stations. But it goes something like this. Alexander Hamilton was the bomb. Born in the West Indies and orphaned from his farm, where he witnessed firsthand the degradation of slavery and was promoted by George Washington for his bravery. He founded the Bank of the Federal Reserve, but Toe Jeff got on his nerve. Toe Jeff, he said, the economy needs to be saved, but T. Jefferson was too busy banging his slave to listen. And that is the paradox of the two party system, cause Alexander Hamilton ain't bullshit. Booyah. I do this shit all day, man. Give me, give me any, any politician, I'll rap him. I'll rap a politician. Trump! Trump. Donald Trump's mom was born in stored away. At a very early age, all the hair on Donald's head had worn away. If you elect him president, beware. How can a man control a country when he can't even control his hair? So the 1800s arrive and we get a steady succession of presidents. Some forgettable, some will eventually have a three-day mattress sale named after them. And in 1825, you get John Quincy Adams, the first true dud. 
the only son of a former president who ended up being a worse president than his dad. That's right, John Quincy Adams purposefully underperformed in the White House to ensure that future sons of presidents would learn from his mistake and never attempt to repeat it. And how did these uh, early POTUSes, POTI, engage with the public? They didn't, not remotely. Oh, they stayed holed up in D.C. amongst their peers, just pontificating and extemporizing and writing lots of doctrines. A doctrine, by the way, is a word that the more you say it, the stupider it starts to sound. Smaller than a writ, but bigger than a pamphlet. But none of these guys would be caught dead fraternizing with the average guy from Main Street, USA. Why would you? Imagine how much more you can get done if you don't have to deal with those pesky citizens and all their rights and demands. Come on, baby, let the good times rule. The candidate who more or less invented campaigning as we know it today was Andrew Jackson. He realized that to win the election of 1828, he was going to have to work the crowd, meet the public, kiss some babies. He began to do something that no milk tit gilded cage candidate had done before. He stumped. What is stumping? Just what it implies. Get yourself a stump, arm yourself with a few all-encompassing phrases, uh, crowd pleasers, like, uh, this is the best potato salad I've ever tasted. Can I count on your vote in November? And then, get to stumping. <sighs> Fellow Americans, thank you very much for inviting me to your wonderful state here in the heartland of America, but also very near the coast. I realize I am probably standing on sacred Indian burial ground and I will fulfill my promise to remove those bodies and relocate them so we can put an all-important manicure parlor here. And that means jobs, jobs, jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Jackson's campaign depended on the persuasive power of personality. Until Jackson, politics in America was an institution. He turned it into a happening, and here's why. The man was a badass. How much of a badass? All right, let's take all 43 presidents, put them into a steel cage, no one comes out alive, battle royale. You have to honor and defend the Constitution. No Apache helicopters allowed. Who wins? The smart money would be on ex-soldiers, like Rutherford B. Hayes, who took five bullets, making him the 50 cent of presidents. But does that make him a tough guy, or just someone who survived a bad shot? Eisenhower had guts. He beat the Nazis. But by the White House years, those guts were inflamed and fallen out from gastroenteritis. Put a 20 on Andrew Jackson. And while you're at it, put Andrew Jackson on a 20. We fired our guns and the British kept a-coming. He killed Indians. He whomped the British in New Orleans. Kicked the Seminoles back to Florida. And as a duelist, once plugged a guy named Charles Dickinson. By the time he decided to run for prez, his temper and passion were legendary. And he kicked the crap out of anybody who called his wife a hoe. Which many people did. In September of 1827, having made up his mind he was going to be president, bar nothing, Jackson started organizing Friends of Jackson rallies throughout the country. His supporters nicknamed him Old Hickory. They called themselves Hurrah Boys, wrote songs, printed pamphlets, planted hickory trees, passed out hickory brooms, hickory sticks, hickory canes. The man literally won election through a concerted arboreal effort. They ripped his opponent, the incumbent John Quincy Adams, to shreds. The Adams camp responded by pointing out that Jackson couldn't even spell the word Europe, which sadly was true. On voting day, they showed up in droves and elected Jackson by a sizable margin. How you like me now? Jackson took office in March 1829. Massive crowds lined the streets of Washington to celebrate. Eventually, they surged into the White House, wiped their feet on the rug, smashed the furniture, cleared out the liquor cabinet, started punching each other. On his first night in office, Jackson slipped out the back door, went and found a room at a local inn. Now that he'd won the first presidential popularity contest, Jackson invented a new party, the Democratic Republicans, nowadays called Democrats. Almost immediately after his inauguration, Jackson's wife got fed up with being called every name in the book and died. So now Jackson is even angrier. 
as soon as he's cleaned up all the broken furniture in the White House, he set about trying to destroy the careers of all the people who had opposed him and fighting the Federal Reserve Bank because Jackson hated paper money. He was a backwoods guy, he believed in gold and silver. Spent eight years fighting the Federal Reserve because he believed that bankers were supreme sleazeballs. And then when he dies, they put his face on a $20 bill. Quite possibly the biggest posthumous fuck you a president has ever received. Also, as a footnote, he was the first president to ever be shot at. He was leaving a funeral at the age of 67 and some twisted geek took two shots at him, missed both times. Jackson promptly responded by beating the living snot out of him with his hickory cane. They don't make them like that anymore. In spite of his contrariness, or possibly because of it, Jackson was assailed by the media of the time, mercilessly lampooned. To lie down with dogs, wake up with fleas. Because he courted public acceptance, he had to accept public derision. Thomas Nast was the most famous of a new breed of journalists who didn't use words as much as he used pictures. He was a political cartoonist with captions. See, back then, a political cartoon served a purpose. A lot of Americans were pig illiterate, but they could look at a cartoon and glean a lot of information. Nast was so skillful at lampooning that just one of his illustrations could destroy a politician's career. But nowadays, I think we can all agree that the ability to draw big ears and bulbous features on a politician doesn't pack the punch it used to. Astoundingly, today there are still over 200 political cartoonists in America. 200 people who have to wake up every day, think of the lamest premise possible, sketch it, rethink it, resketch it, color it in, deliver it to the editor so that we can look at it in the paper and do this. Seriously, have you ever overheard anyone say, hey, did you see that political cartoon in the paper today? <laughs> God, David Cameron had a, had a head like a condom. Ha! Woo! Seriously, if you're a political cartoonist, do yourself a favor. Go down there to Leicester Square, get yourself a stall, surround yourself by pictures of dead rock stars like Kurt Cobain and Jim Morrison, and just make a living hoodwinking tourists by drawing their giant engorged heads onto little tiny bodies. You'd be better off. Hack. By the middle of the 1800s, Americans were finally involved in the election of their president. Andrew Jackson had changed voting forever. From now on, if you wanted to be president, you had to bid for the votes of the masses. And that, of course, meant spin, 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 media spin. You think that's a modern phenomenon? William Henry Harrison, born into a wealthy family. Father was governor of Virginia. He was educated at Hampton Sydney College. He was five foot eight inches of pure, unadulterated toffee. In the election of 1840, Harrison and his party, the Whigs, took an offhanded comment by a Baltimore newspaper that said, quote, Harrison looks like someone that if you gave him a barrel of hard cider and a pension, he'd spend the rest of his life sitting in a log cabin studying moral philosophy. Well, his party supporters picked up on that hard cider and log cabin reference and gave it the full spin. Look at me. All of a sudden, the guy who owned a 2,000-acre farm with slaves was transformed into a hard-drinking, big, stinking backwoods philosopher. The Whig Party organized rallies for Harrison that could only be measured in terms of acreage. The parades were 10 miles long. What Hickory had done for Jackson, log cabins did for Harrison. Harrison won the election over Martin Van Buren, and then because he had to keep up this uh, outdoorsman persona, he delivered his inaugural speech in his shirt sleeves in January, in the snow, for two hours. Then he went off and died. His greatest contribution as president was to the lexicon. A distiller started selling William Henry Harrison commemorative whiskey bottles in the shape of a log cabin. That man's name was E.C. 
booze. And so the parade of presidents rolls on, each campaign more vigorous than the one before. Newspapers come and go. By the early 20th century, thanks to the airwaves, everyone knows what a president sounds like. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite... In, in Beaver, Idaho, 1927, a man named Philo Farnsworth, puttering around in his garage, invents something called the image dissector, and modern television is born. Now, inevitably, thanks to television, anyone running for president comes under a new kind of scrutiny in living black and white. In 1946, 8,000 Americans own televisions, and by 1948, that number had swollen to 350,000. That was the year of the Dewey-Truman election, and for the first time, Americans got to see their candidates on the box. So both the Democrats and the Republicans chose to hold their nominating conventions on the East Coast to take advantage of the time zone. In Philadelphia, Harry Truman went to the podium to accept the Democratic Party nomination. Now, Truman was an incumbent president, but his victory was nowhere assured. Nor was it a good sign when a lot of pre-celebratory pigeons were released, freaked out, started crapping on the conventioneers like something out of a Hitchcock movie. In fact, the Republican candidate, Thomas E. Dewey, was so assured of stealing the presidency that his advisor told him, just don't say anything stupid and you're in. Every poll and newscast seemed to support this. We now know that Governor Dewey will carry New York State by at least 50,000 votes and that he will be the next president of the United States. And on November 2nd, 1948, Harry Truman went to bed a loser and woke up in the morning president. So radio and this newfangled TV coverage managed to convince many Republican voters that Dewey was a sure thing. So they didn't even bother to turn out and vote. Truman squeaked back in by slightly more than two million votes. November 3rd, 1948 marks the one and only time in history that a newspaper got something wrong. Television has established itself as a new and vital tool in future election campaigns but it won't be long before the novelty wears off. When did television campaigning get ugly? Certainly not at the beginning. In 1952, about the only slanderous thing that Democratic frontrunner Adlai Stevenson could say against his opponent, General Dwight David Eisenhower, was that Eisenhower appeared to have grown to a height of eight feet six inches. Eisenhower answers America. General, I'd like to get married, but we couldn't live on the salary I get after taxes. Well, the Democrats are sinking deeper into a bottomless sea of debt and demanding more taxes to keep their confused heads above water. Stevenson supporters fought back tooth and nail with a series of devastating show tunes. I'd rather have a man who knows what to do when he gets to be the press. I love the, gov the governor of Illinois. Unlike the governor of Illinois, Eisenhower had no real political experience. He was, by his own admission, a lifelong professional soldier. He'd been dragged into the race from a tide of national hero worship. He returned home and his own people took him to their hearts. Stevenson was an egghead, the thinking fellers candidate, and thus hopelessly unsuited for the presidency. In fact, he was quoted as saying, I have no ambition to be president. I have no desire for the office, mentally, temperamentally, or physically, and then promised to shoot himself if he were nominated. Uh, the Democrats nominated him anyway. Both candidates were what you would call nice guys. Who needs that? Hey, if nice guys were electable, Adam Hills would be a president somewhere. Turns out TV wants to see the dark underbelly, the savage heart, the snake in the woodpile. Fortunately, in 1952, such a snake reared its head. My fellow Americans, I come before you tonight as a candidate for the vice presidency and as a man whose honesty and, te and integrity has been questioned. For Nixon, exposure on television was both beneficial and deceptive. We're looking for those moments where yeah. you see the real person when you look at that person, do you trust them? Do you feel like they keep it real? Or do you feel like, mm, this? I don't really know what this person believes? 
you know, just because you tell us you think something or you feel something, are we inspired by you? Do we, do we know what you believe? And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, Nixon verbally had lots of what we call deceptive hotspots in my world. Yeah. But then he had the body language hotspots. You see Nixon holding on to the lectern. We tell people what we are, not what we're not. Nixon said, I am not a crook. Because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. And he's like, and I welcome this, these questions. And he, he steps back from the podium and crosses his arms. And he's like robotic. I've earned everything I've got. We lean towards people and things and ideas that we like, and we lean away from people and ideas and confrontation that we don't like. I've earned everything I've got. You feel it. You're like, this guy's fake. He's phony. He's lying about something. But can't you also just see coached? Their coach. Yeah, of course. Hillary um, Clinton. Hillary Clinton comes out like this, right? Like she's the Christ. We call this the Christ pose. Like she's on the cross. And then she does the A-OK -okay at the end of her hands. So she stands out here and she's like, hello, everybody. Like, I'm your savior. I'm here to save you. If you want a president who will listen to you, work her heart out to make your life better. And together to build a stronger, fairer, better country. Al Gore. Al Gore one time, he was debating against George W. Bush. They were both seen as presidential, both seen as likable going into that debate. What happened? Al Gore speaks. It's George W.'s turn. He speaks. Al Gore stands up, walks over to George W. It's not only what's your philosophy and what's your position on issues, but can you get things done? And like stands over him. It was so disrespectful, like intimidating him. And George Bush looks over at Gore and is like, how you doing? But can you get things done? <laughs> and I believe I can. All right. It, it made George Bush look likable, even more likable, in control, and not going to be pushed around easily. So we have a, an incredible country. From people like uh, me, Donald be Trump being in the race is fun. Because he's showing up real. Mm -hmm. We don't have victories anymore. You feel like the guy that stands up on that stand is the same guy that's going to talk to you at dinner. And, and if he thinks you're an asshole, he's going to say, dude. And that's all you got to go on, you that's know? That's it. Nowadays, candidates live in a world somewhere between character assessment and character assassination. JFK was likable. Nixon was shifty, so JFK won. People look at you on TV. They make up their mind in a heartbeat, deciding if you've got that likability factor. And by likability, I mean, is there remotely anything about these wazulas that you, the voter, can relate to? So for a long while, telegenix, TBQ as they like to call it, uh, you know, it went a long way in determining who would be the next president. Those viewers could look at a candidate's debating skills, his speeches, his actions, and determine for themselves who was the most decisive, who was the most presidential, and the single most important factor in choosing a president, who is the guy you would most like to sit down and have a beer with. It's the most difficult personal hurdle that a POTUS contender can overcome. So who is the guy you would most want to have a beer with? Okay, forget any of the Mount Rushmore guys, because you know that's like drinking with a celebrity, right? Yeah. You just yeah, you just you just want to get a selfie yeah. taken. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Jackson, mean drunk Bill Clinton, yeah, sure. If you don't mind being a wingman while he sneaks off with some waitress to take care of business in the back of a Camaro, nope. The guy you want to drink with is Harding, Warren Gamaliel Harding. Yeah. <laughs> Harding would have been the perfect drinking buddy. He played baseball and golf, played poker like a maniac, once won an entire newspaper company in a card game. Even when he was president, kept flitting back off to Ohio to sit on the porch and polish off cocktails with his small town pals. And this was during Prohibition. Boy, does a man have stories. And I don't mean, uh, you know, the, I'm kind of a big deal in the White House stories. I'm talking about stories, you know multiple terms in the Oval Office if you get my drift. Warren G. Harding, 
affectionately known as Warren G. Hardon, made Bill Clinton look like the guy at the prom with acne. Slept with his wife's best friend, slept with his best friend's wife, his own wife, Flo, Flo, was some kind of hectoring ball buster who traveled with her coterie of acolytes and advisors and once tried to put a seance chair in the White House living room. Isn't that the best kind of drinking, buddy? The kind whose personal stories are so horrific that they make you feel better about your own pathetic life? Damn right it is. Warren G. Harding is your man. So let's go order up a couple more pictures of beer and some plates of ribs and check out the rack on that waitress. Back to the question. At what point did modern campaigning get ugly? I mean, really, really ugly. 1972, the sitting president, Richard Nixon, set out to destroy the Democratic primary by pitting its four main candidates, Hubert Humphrey, George McGovern, Scoop Jackson, and Edmund Muskie, against each other. Cutthroat. Who can take the Nixon had already spent four years in the White House doing a perfunctory job of running things. No one could quite get a bead on his character. He just seemed shady. They didn't nickname him Tricky Dick for nothing. Of course, while Nixon was respected by Americans for being strong and tough, nobody really loved him. And uh, he was not exactly a warm figure that uh, gave off uh, sort of popular uh, vibes. So Nixon had to worry about his reelection. Just remember. We cannot fulfill the American dream unless each American has a chance to fulfill his own dream. That's what we believe in. Nixon was leaving nothing to chance. So first of all, he infiltrated the Democratic primaries so he would get the opponent he knew he could destroy. They were um, doing all kinds of uh, sabotaging events, giving false information, trying in every way to weaken the candidates that Nixon most feared as potential opponents. Donald Segretti, one of Nixon's campaign workers, wrote a letter on stationery belonging to Democratic nominee Edmund Muskie. The letter was meant to cause chaos, accusing Humphrey and Scoop Jackson of sexual and alcoholic misconduct. Some years later, Segretti would eventually admit they were lies. Each and every allegation in the letter was untrue and without any basis in fact. It was not my desire to have anyone believe the letter but instead it was intended to create confusion among the various candidates. But in 1972, Nixon's plan had worked. The Democrats basically started cannibalizing each other, and McGovern moved to the forefront of Democratic contenders. He wanted to run against George McGovern. He thought George McGovern was the most vulnerable potential opponent, the person he could most easily defeat. Seldom in American history have presidential candidates held such sharply opposing views on major issues. McGovern wants to end the Vietnam War immediately. Nixon's re-election committee had more money than they knew what to do with, and they used it to paint McGovern as a fuzzy socialist. Senator George McGovern recently submitted a welfare bill to the Congress. According to an analysis by the Senate Finance Committee, the McGovern bill would make 47% of the people in the United States eligible for welfare. Nixon had a systematic campaign to relentlessly tag McGovern as a radical and an extremist, tying McGovern to the Yippies, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, uh, even one uh, anonymous piece trying to connect him to Charles Manson. And who's going to pay for this? Well, if you're not the one out of two people on welfare, you do. The McGovern camp responded by pointing out a tiny infraction by the Nixon campaign organization that they had broken into the Democratic campaign headquarters at Watergate. This is about credibility. This is about electronics. This is about bugging. This is about spying. Nixon stressed that McGovern would wreck the military. The McGovern defense plan. He would cut the Marines by one third the Air Force by one-third. Meanwhile, McGovern could not emphasize enough. This is about deception. This is about the White House. 
And this is how you stop it. With your vote. Watergate. Watergate. Yep. No, no, I'm still here. I'm still here. The director has forced me into this lead pipe obvious joke that some people broke into Watergate in 1972. Watergate. Break in. Hey, everybody. Who can make the rain? Despite McGovern's efforts, Nixon was still the favorite for the election. He shifted his presidency into turbo drive. He visited China. He made deals with Russia. He got tougher on Vietnam while at the same time brokering a peace resolution. All in a few months, which just goes to show you how much a president can get done when someone is gunning for his job. He was a strategist. He was relentless in his thinking, even as he was immoral in his, in his tactics. He even manipulated the economy, juggling stats and figures to make everything in America look peachy keen. All so he could sail into the Oval Office on a victorious cumulonimbus cloud made entirely of ticker tape. Sorry, that last description really got out of hand. A candy it's hard to believe in this modern age of what they call transparency that voters would choose to ignore the fact that a sitting president had orchestrated the burglary of his opponent's campaign headquarters, but they did. And then they sat back and watched McGovern slowly defeat himself. He chose as his running mate Thomas Eagleton, a senator from Missouri. Somehow revelations hit the newspaper about Thomas Eagleton. It was reported that he'd undergone electroshock therapy for clinical depression and questions began to arise about his ability to function as McGovern's second-in-command. Well, McGovern said he was 1,000% behind Eagleton, and then two days later, shoved him out the door. Yep, replaced him with R. Sergeant Shriver. McGovern had made the biggest mistake a politician can make, which is to stab your buddy in the back. Apparently, that's a lot worse than breaking into Watergate. Nixon won by a landslide, and then America watched the whole thing unravel. At the time Nixon resigned in August of 1974, the man who had once been affable old Ike's running mate was the most hated politician in the history of history. He thought he was the king of Nixon spent two more years in office and was forced to resign, the only POTUS to do so, although it was touch and go at one point for Bill Clinton. One of the last conversations I had with uh, uh, President Eisenhower, as a matter of fact, the last conversation I had with him before I was inaugurated, uh, he called me on the phone. He said he wanted to wish me well. And then he went on to say, and his voice broke a bit when he said it, he said, you know, I have only one regret on this great day. This is the last time I can ever call you Dick. The 1972 elections are full of almost Shakespearean intrigue and deception and anger and chaos, and yet apparently so uneventful that Hunter S. Thompson feels the need to make up stuff about Ibogaine and Brazilian witch doctors. Why? Because Americans know it's hype. It's all one big dog and pony extravaganza. They watched the spectacle of men fighting savagely for a party nomination, calling each other whores and traitors and slime balls, right up until the convention. An air of expectancy hangs over the Cow Palace as the time for the chief business of the convention, the nominations, approaches. But then, once the guy's nominated, they all come together in a miraculous mutual orgasm of party unity. Come on, let's let bygones be bygones and join together and put the old stomp and whip song on the opposing candidate. And then the real race begins. It'll be won by the team with the best organization and the most money. You gather as many earnest, unjaded foot soldiers as you possibly can. You canvass every state by foot and by phone, and you work it just like Santa Claus. The only problem is Santa Claus doesn't exist, and neither does true democracy, because we don't elect the president, just in case you didn't know it. Nope, we go to the polls, and we write down on a piece of paper who we would like to see president. So 
So quite simply, we the people don't directly vote for the president. We cast our vote for our state's electors who are pledged to one or another presidential candidate. And this system is called the Electoral College. Look, we all know why we had an Electoral College in the original Constitution. It was because the folks that drafted the Constitution didn't trust average folks to elect the president. They wanted them to vote for people like them who then would elect the president. Well, that was in 1787. Yeah, it's a flawed system. And it allowed George W. Bush to get elected when he beat Al Gore. It's absolutely dumb. And we ended up with a situation in which one guy won the popular vote and the other guy became president. And in my opinion, it was a disaster. Yep, the best man doesn't always win. Let's imagine for a second an alternative historical scenario. What if Al Gore had become president? How would the world be different? Sorry, can't come up with anything. Nothing would have changed. His most notable achievement would be uh, just making it into this documentary to fill up some space. Same as his presidency. Yeah, he might have lowered global temperatures by, I don't know, half a degree, but let's face it, the Kardashians would still be showing way too much skin. Nothing changes. So now, you've made it to the White House. Congratulations, Mr. Big Face. You're the leader of the free world. But have you bothered to read the job description? What do we expect of a president? Well, obviously and unbelievably, everything. After all, he's the most powerful man on earth, right? Yeah, on paper. But when a president gets into office, he has to spend a lot of time just trying to acquire power. I'll give you a hypothetical example. As president, I will ban all Muslims. Can he do that? Does he have the authority? Yeah, well, sort of. He could invoke Section 8 of the U.S. Code, which says if any class of immigrants would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, tell your story walking. But then he would have to get the majority of Congress to agree with him, and then they would be challenged by the Supreme Court, who would probably override the whole thing as incredibly, incredibly unconstitutional. So it's likely that the ban would be imposed, stalled, rescinded, then reimposed, stalled, re-rescinded, leaving a lot of angry Muslims stranded at the airport. And that would be one busy multi-faith prayer room. What's your point, Rich, other than trying to open a floodgate of angry letters from the BBC? My point is that a president has to fight for every decision. Boom, no knockout, 12 brutal rounds against federal judges, and congressmen, the Supreme Court, the opposing party, people within his own party. It's a constant, unending grind. Fight the power! Fight the power! Fight the power! The perception is that the president is, is the most powerful man in the world. Yeah, he, he stands atop our government, and he exercises power in a way that no other political actor in the United States does, on the one hand. But on the other hand, he operates in a system that's stacked against him. And so he stumbles and scratches and claws for power wherever he can find it. Take, for instance, Obama's repeated efforts on gun control. In the aftermath of Sandy Hook, he comes out, puts together a, a commission led by his vice president that's going to propose all kinds of legislative enactments, and he hits a wall in Congress, doesn't get anywhere. And he's the president, he's the president of the United States, and he's just He's grasping for whatever he can find in order to make advancements. So a savvy president doesn't wade into a mass confrontation against judges and congressmen and opposing linebackers. He does an end run. There are a lot of unilateral powers that presidents have claimed, they've invented, they've adapted to suit their needs, executive orders, national security directives, memoranda. The security directive is the president's ultimate secret weapon. It's like a double-barreled shotgun, but one of the barrels is always bent and aimed at their own foot. He uses it when he has to make a decision that he thinks is right for the moment, but probably won't look that good in retrospect. He'll use it if it's a time of crisis, or if he wants to create a crisis. Congress never finds out about security directives until it's too late to do anything about it and they're not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. 
So Americans have no idea how many security directives are floating around out there. But one thing's for certain, every president since Truman, who more or less invented it, has used them. Truman called them NSDs, National Security Directives. And he issued one that basically said, if Japan ever pulls that Pearl Harbor shit again, this time we don't screw around for two years, we annihilate them right away. Naturally, when Congress caught wind of this, they said, hey, hey, Harry, you can't just go around willy-nilly threatening nations with a hydrogen bomb. Enough with the NSDs. So since then, presidents just keep changing the initials of a security directive and redefining them for their own purposes. When Eisenhower became president and wanted to force an embargo against trade with the USSR, he just changed the name from NSD to NSCP, National Security Council Policy and adapted it to his needs. JFK used one to invade the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. He renamed it an NSAM, National Security Action Memorandum. Reagan changed the NSAM to NSDD, which I believe means National Security Decision Directive. Promptly sold arms to Iran, then funneled the money to Contras in Nicaragua. And George Bush changed the NSDD to NSPD. National Security Presidential Directive. He didn't know what it meant. He can't spell. So basically, whenever a president wants to do something that he's pretty sure is a little bit ropey, he just shuffles some letters and uh, hopes he doesn't get caught. Because that's what presidents do. A lot of sneaking around behind Congress's back. The odds are stacked against them. They don't have the power they need, which is precisely why they scratch and claw at every turn to get what power they can in order to make a lasting mark. And those who, who do or those who, who, who leave a legacy uh, worth remembering. Nobody wants to be remembered as a crap president. How do you know you are a crap president? Very simple. After you're dead, just look around and see how much stuff is named after you. If all it is is a library and an elementary school in a rundown neighborhood, yeah, you were, you were a pretty crappy president. But the good thing about bad presidents, they save Americans money. George Washington, father of our country. Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence. Abraham Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation. Without a doubt, these men and more serve their country gloriously. They'll be forever in our hearts. But isn't that enough? Do you know how much of Americans' hard-earned money goes to maintaining these granite monstrosities year after year? Hundreds of millions, that's how much. Jesus, do we have to prop up their rampant dead egos forever? Why can't a candidate just say, look, elect me, I will serve faithfully for four years, eight years tops. And then when I'm dead, I'll have myself buried in an unmarked grave underneath a random overpass somewhere. I will never cost you another dime. I'd vote for that person. Hi, my name is Rubens Cream. I'm running for president of America. I have a four platform plank, plank number one, time travel research. I'm the only candidate who will go back in time and kill baby Hitler with my own bare hand. Ultimately, you go down in presidential history as good or bad. So, what makes a good president? A good president is one who is not ideological, but who is pragmatic. I think in the last 20 years in this country, we've had a pragmatist in the White House, and his wife might be the next pragmatist in the White House. Any leader throughout history has to be larger than life. The presidents who were larger than life, but who had within them uh, caring and concern were probably the best presidents, like FDR, like Abraham Lincoln. The, the great presidents generally governed in times of crisis, which made their actions, their role, their, their presidency more important in many ways. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt a great president? Yes, a great president. No question about it. There have been great presidents, but let's face it, America's history is also littered with intelligent, talented, effective men who wasted a sizable chunk of their lives being president. Jimmy Carter was a U.S. naval officer, nuclear engineer, successful farmer, Georgia governor, and human rights activist. 
But for four years, between 1977 and 1981, he completely disappeared from the face of the earth. Nobody knew where he was. Turns out, he was holed up in this building, ineptly trying to free a bunch of hostages in Iran for four years. Fortunately, the man realized what a colossal waste of time being president was and went back to doing something useful, namely, building houses for homeless people and winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Carter's uneventful term in the White House made him realize what he was supposed to be doing with his talents. He learned something about himself from his experience, which is more than you can say for some presidents. What would your biggest mistake be, would you say, and what lessons have you learned from it? Hmm. I wish you'd give me this written question ahead of time so I could plan for it. You know, I, I hope I, I don't want to sound like I've made no mistakes. I'm confident I have. I just haven't, you just put me under the spot here and maybe I'm not quick, as quick on my feet as I should be in coming up with one. So maybe a good fitting last question is, did anybody ever have fun being president? Yeah, I'm pretty sure one guy did, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, I can't stress enough that Teddy Roosevelt was a borderline psychopath on whom no presidential standards should be based, but boy, did he love the job. And being president was just one of the things he did, between cattle ranching, writing books, modeling mustaches, shooting Spaniards, invading helpless countries, and building the world's biggest canal. He put a boxing ring in the White House, ran up and down the staircases every day, walked around whacking all his friends with a big stick. Does this remind you of anyone? I think it's a safe bet that somewhere in Putin's library is a really dog-eared biography of Teddy Roosevelt. When his eight years were up, he went off to Africa to shoot critters, got bored, came back, started up his own party so he could do it all again. Yep, that's what Teddy Roosevelt did. How many times have you checked your Facebook page in the last hour? Four? Lightweight. Show me a person who had fun being president. And I'll show you someone who needs therapy. Recently, if I were to pick one, I'd pick Clinton. I think he relished his time in office in ways that other presidents have not. For them, it's been a little bit more of a, of a, of a slog. I was actually an admirer of Bush 1's foreign policy. He had a, a view of the world which I thought was really quite mature and quite responsible. And talked about it at some length, by the way, in his memoirs. Too bad his kid didn't read them. I don't think anyone ever had as much fun in the presidency as FDR. Franklin Roosevelt loved power, loved political manipulation, loved getting things done. This is a man who really reveled in being president. I think Johnson was probably the one that I would pick. I mean, he played a lot of dirty tricks to win that election in 64, but when he was president, he brought all that Texas wheeling and dealing and profanity and whiskey drinking and everything to the White House, and he was larger than life, and he really, really, I think, enjoyed being president, and I think hated to leave it, but he was, of course, done in by the Vietnam War. Well, none of them want to leave because it, it means, you know, that their, their life as the center of the universe uh, is over. Yeah. You have to want it. It's an impossible job. It's a job that, that would break most men. It's also a job that launches you into history and allows you to affect change in ways that no other job can. Wouldn't you like to be the most powerful person in the free world? My guess is that being president, for better or worse, is a long, strange trip you never quite come back from. After all, you've been the most powerful man in the world. What are you going to do for a rush after that? That's why Bill Clinton is going to feel like the luckiest guy in the world if he gets back into the White House as the first dude gets to run around and pee in every corner and remark his territory. If that sounds like a prediction, it is. You don't have to panic, Britain. Donald Trump is not going to be president. I will wager everything on that. I will go so far as to say, if Donald Trump becomes president, I will never appear on British television again. And that is a promise. Ha! <laughs> Who am I kidding? Trump becomes president, I'm spending all my time in Britain. I'm Rich Hall, and I approve this message.
election is a thing that happens every four years in America where we get to watch a lot of ego-obsessed men and women say crazy things, trip over mic cables, insult each other, and generally engage in a series of antics that makes us briefly forget we live in a world of destructive policies and a state of grim hopelessness created by these very fuck sticks. Donald Trump likes to sue people. He should sue whoever did that to his face with that. Given that being president of the United States could very likely put you in a premature grave, it's fairly astonishing that at the beginning of 2016, 23 hopeful Americans threw their hat in the ring for the nation's top job. At some point, every one of these candidates has looked in the mirror and said to themselves, you know what this country needs? Me. That's the kind of haploid, diploid, megalomaniacal level of self-delusion you need to run for president. When I'm president, we're getting rid of Obamacare. They all talk about passion, service, wanting to do it for their country. Of course, there's a huge amount of ego involved in all this. I turned out to be 100% right on illegal immigration. People two weeks ago that were going after me, even the reporters. And you're talking about a group of men, and so far they've all been men, who have been basically convinced from birth that they were the center of the universe. But I think most of the people running for president actually believe that they have a talent, a philosophy, an ideology, an ability to lead people, really an extraordinary gift. And if they don't, we generally find out really quickly. And where do we find out? On the campaign trail. When I'm president, you will not get into the United States of America. It's gonna get tough. You're going to be on the road for two years. You're going to spend up to a billion dollars. You're going to expend a whole lot of shoe leather. And you're going to have to make some bold statements. A total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. You're going to get attacked. Your past and your family are going to come under intense scrutiny. And God help you if you've got any dirty laundry. I am confident that I never sent nor received any information that was classified at the time it was sent and received. If you're going to be POTUS, President of the United States, you're going to have to fight dirty because it's the most downright grueling election on the planet. There's nothing easy about running for president, I can tell you. It's tough, it's nasty, it's mean, it's vicious, it's beautiful. And you know what? It's all been done before. Yeah. The 1964 presidential campaign between Lyndon Johnson and his challenger Barry Goldwater introduced a vicious new tactic into presidential campaigning. Quotemanship. The idea of taking what a candidate says and turning it against them. Johnson created a series of TV ads that portrayed Goldwater as some kind of deranged whack job who, if elected, would destroy all of mankind. We must either love each other or we must die. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. Mr. Johnson set out on a political career 27 years ago, a road that led to the White House. By the time of the 1964 election, Johnson had already been in the White House for a year, having stepped in after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He was seen as the likable heir apparent, but with a hidden agenda. He knows he's going to win, but what he, what he wants is a huge landslide victory. Because remember how insecure Lyndon Johnson was. He was following the most popular president, maybe to this day. And he didn't just want to win. He really wanted to win by a lot. Because to him, that meant that the American people loved him. And that, therefore, he could move forward out from beneath the shadow cast by the JFK presidency. Labor Day, Senator Goldwater has traveled tens of thousands of miles to discuss the issues of the campaign. Goldwater made the agenda easy for Johnson. His slogan was, in your heart, you know he's right. And he was, extreme right. Now, Goldwater was an accomplished senator, an ex-Air Force pilot, very close friend of the late JFK, but he didn't care much for Russia or China or any other commie red bastard, and he didn't bother trying to soft soap it. And we must make clear that until its goals of conquest are absolutely renounced and its relations with all nations tempered, communism 
and the governments it now controls are enemies of every man on earth who is or wants to be free. In terms of articulation, let's compare that to a modern-day candidate with a whole team of speechwriters and researchers at his disposal. Hey, I'm not saying they're stupid. I like China. I sell apartment for 10... I just sold an apartment for $15 million to somebody from China. Am I supposed to dislike it? Goldwater had all the oratorical tools. Alliteration, assonance, litotes, pleonasms, exclamations, epigrams, classical quotes, way more than the average American could absorb. When he accepted the Republican nomination in San Francisco in 1964, he pretty much dropped the Trumpism of his day. I would remind you that extreme... Severe diarrhea. William Henry Harrison caught pneumonia right after his inauguration. Doctors treated him with leeches in Virginia snake root. He died after being president for only 32 days. You still want the job? Fine. Just make sure that you're rich, white Protestant male, and a Freemason. Or ugly, born in a log cabin, and clinically depressed. Because one thing is for certain. If being POTUS doesn't kill you, it's going to prematurely age you. Just look at Obama. When he came into office, he was a good-looking, vibrant man. Now look at him. Face like a used tire. So, according to the odds, there's roughly a 40% chance that as president, somebody's going to try to assassinate you. But there is a 100% chance of character assassination. Excited. How many people here are ready to turn the White House red again? How many people here are ready to go out there and tell Hillary Clinton what difference it really makes? What difference does it make? I'm here at the presidential town hall, and these Bush supporters are feeling very good about their candidate. What do you say, guys? As a kid, my mom said, work hard, you can become president, because I grew up in a Disney film. That was back when we believed that presidents were righteous and honorable, because after all, they were president. And that died in about 1974 with Richard Nixon, Watergate, blah, 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 blah. But Rich, can anybody be president? Well, that depends on your circumstances. If you find yourself standing outside of a Walmart bathroom at 3 in the morning, waiting on the results of your girlfriend's pregnancy test, no. You're not going to be president. But I've watched every episode of West Wing. I want to change the world. Screw you. Go start a soup kitchen. Being president is a hard job, and you really, really have to want it. When you're president, you've got thousands of bosses. Half of them demand stuff way outside your job description. The other half wouldn't mind too terribly if you were dead. So you need Disney-sized motivation, the kind of motivation that craves abuse. And here's the kicker. There's a pretty good chance the job is going to kill you. Of the 43 men who've been president, four have been assassinated, all by gunshots. Another 13 presidents have been shot at, had grenades thrown at them, car bombs planted, or someone tried to crash their plane. And for every president who's been killed on the job, there's another one where the job killed them. Franklin Roosevelt and Warren G. Harding killed over from heart attacks. Zachary Taylor ate some bad cherries during a 4th of July celebration at Washington Monument, died of severe